welcome to the February Journal Club, everyone. Um, and hello to anyone who may be watching this subsequently on the YouTube channel. Thank you very much for joining. Um, next slide, please. As always, very grateful for the team um, and the hard work behind the scenes. Um, next slide, please. Um, this is our customary disclaimer slide. Uh, it has not changed. <laughs> Next slide. Um, so St. Louis, um, Missouri seems like quite a place. Um, I have unfortunately yet to visit, but as soon as I'm unshackled from the Australian fortress, I'll definitely make every effort. Um, for me personally, uh, the World Chess Hall of Fame and also the um, mosaic uh, seems to stand out, particularly because I was born in the former USSR, and those things are quite um, quite inherent to Russian-speaking folk. Um, I do see that there's a lot of um, fascination with size and the biggest and the largest, and I do hope that the patients don't reflect that in the BMI in um, in your in your center. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we're very grateful to have this session hosted um, with this excellent academic faculty. Um, certainly from a tr training perspective, it is, um, it is very reputable and there's many successful alumni in the colorectal community. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'd like to take um, um, this opportunity, particularly to thank Dr. Weiss, um, but also to get him to perhaps introduce the, his faculty and the presenters. Thank you, Vladimir. I really appreciate it. And we really appreciate the opportunity to be able to host uh, this evening. Uh, it's, it's really a great honor, especially to have uh, the name uh, with of all this associated with uh, James Church and all that he has done with uh, hereditary colorectal cancer, much less uh, colorectal surgery uh, in general. So we're really honored to participate. Um, as you mentioned, I'm Paul Wise. I'm also a general surgery residency program director and helped to run our inherited uh, registry here. Uh, two of our um, presenters tonight will be our fellows who are listed there, uh, Jeff Sun and Kayla Luo. Uh, Kayla is going to be going to uh, UT Knoxville uh, to participate there, and uh, Jeff would love a job in the DC area, so if anyone is looking, uh, we would love to uh, try to get him a job where his wife is currently in practice, uh, so we're looking for that opportunity as well this evening, but they'll be presenting our articles. The discussants for those articles, uh, Sean Glasgow, who uh, did his general surgery residency training here and then was at Minnesota, um, and then was uh, did uh, some work in the military before coming back here, uh, which has been a thrill for us to have him back uh, as associate professor of surgery. And then uh, Radhika Smith, who was at uh, Temple and that, uh, and then at uh, Cleveland Clinic, Florida, and up at uh, University of Chicago for a little while before uh, coming here, uh, will also be our other uh, discussant uh, this evening. Uh, Matt Much is known to many of you all. Um, he's uh, our chief and uh, professor of surgery and has also been very active in the ASCRS and, and its leadership um, and has uh, did his uh, general surgery residency here and then was at Leahy Clinic uh, for his fellowship prior to coming back and has been on faculty since that time. Uh, Steve Hunt is also well known to many of you all, has also been active in the organization uh, and uh, has did both his general surgery residency and fellowship here. Uh, Matt Silvera uh, did his residency at Temple and then fellowship here. And then Carrie Ullman did her uh, residency and fellowship here as well. Uh, I myself did my fellowship here. So uh, all of us except uh, Radhika have escaped uh, the, uh, the clutches of the Washington University in St. Louis uh, training in, in some way or other, but we're uh, thrilled to have her here to help balance out uh, all the rest of us. So we're really excited to participate. Vladimir, thank you very much for having us. And again, it's an honor to be associated with uh, this evening, uh, at least in part, uh, having James Church as our guest. So thanks. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. Um, James Church, of course, is a, um, very well known, and uh, I don't think I'll have the uh, enough time if I use the whole hour to um, to describe his accomplishments. Um, but this session was actually suggested by him uh, following our first session in the Cleveland Clinic. He contacted me and recommended having a hereditary session, and particularly having it um, joint 
uh, with the Washington University. So, so um, I, I think that's been a great idea. Um, next slide, please. So um, we're going to have two polls, um, partly associated with the papers. Um, and the first poll, uh, Stephen Brenstead is um, uh, going to collate the results, but essentially um, extrapolating from one of the other papers we had this month by um, Emma Wood, um, uh, mental health symptoms in patients with familial adenomatous polyposis. How is the mental health of patients and of family members um, with hereditary colorectal cancer syndromes addressed in your practice? Meaning, um, you know, do you routinely screen for it? Do you consider it? Is it never really on the radar? And potentially, maybe depending on the results, we may consider if it's worth um, if it's worth changing that or making it somehow. Uh, integrated into the colorectal um, sort of uh, template of the institutions you're in. So um, now without further to do, we'll move on to the next slide whilst people are answering the polls. And um, if I can um, yes. Um, I'm sorry, my computer seems to be a little bit frozen, but oh yeah, that, that seems to be better. So if I can get Dr. Sun to uh, start kindly presenting uh, the first paper and Dr. Glasgow will then give us some expert tips uh, following. Thank you. All right, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I wanna thank Dr. Wise and the journal for the opportunity to present today. Uh, I'll start on the first study, which is entitled Risk Factors Associated with Pouch Adenomas in Patients with familiar adenomatous polyposis. Uh, next slide, please. Restorative proctocolectomy with IPA is a procedure of choice for FAP patients who have rectal involvement. After colectomy, extracolonic manifestations such as duodenal adenomas and desmoids become important determinants in an FAP patient's life expectancy. Several groups have also reported adenomatous development in the pouch itself as a key outcome, with reported rates varying between 30 and 60%. Uh, possibly related to time interval after pouch surgery or the presence of duodenal adenomas. However, these existing data have been based on small samples with heterogeneous findings. Therefore, the authors uh, of this study aim to explore the prevalence and risk factors associated with development in pouch adenomas in a large sample of FAB patients. So this was a German cohort study conducted at the University of Heidelberg, which is a high volume, highly specialized institution and included consecutive patients with FAP who had un undergone pouch surgery and were seen between 2010 and 2013. These patients had regular follow-up, including clinical exams and yearly endoscopies of the pouch. Follow-up upper endoscopies, um, uh, dependent on the current Spiegelman stage, and other than endoscopy reports, clinical data, mutational analyses, and pathology reports were retrieved from the Heidelberg Polyposis Register. Uh, specifically, adenomas arising from the remaining rectal mucosa or an anal transition zone were excluded from this analysis. And the primary objective of the study was to determine the prevalence and risk factors for pouch adenomas. Secondary outcomes included adenoma-free survival. Uh, next slide, please. In total, 192 patients were included in this study. This table shows the demographic and clinical characteristics of patients with and without pouch adenomas. Histologically confirmed adenomas were detected in 90 patients, which is about 47% at a median of 8.5 years after pouch surgery. Uh, most of these patients had low severity polyp burden defined as less than four adenomas within the pouch. And most of these polyps were tubular adenomas. Um, one patient did develop pouch carcinoma during follow-up. Before adjustment, um, Male patients, patients with duodenal and gastric adenomas seem to be more associated with the presence of pouch adenomas, whereas the presence of desmoid tumors, the number of bowel movements and pouchitis did not. Uh, the authors also commented on information. Um, uh, there was information on germline mutation was only available in about 70% of these patients. And the authors found no difference in the distribution of germline mutations between patients with and without pouch adenomas. Uh, next slide, please. So this figure shows the Kaplan-Meier estimation of pouch adenoma-free survival um, in overall patients, and also stratified by age, at IPAA, gender, and the presence of gastric adenoma. At five years, about 85% of overall patients were free from pouch adenomas, but 
decreases in a linear fashion. Um, and at 20 years, only an estimated 22% of patients will be free of adenomas. Uh, after adjustment using a Cox proportional hazards model, male sex, gastroadenomas, and age at time of IPA at less than 18 years old were independently associated with developing pouch adenomas. Next, next slide, please. So in conclusion, the authors anticipate that at 20 years after pouch surgery, adenoma-free survival is about 22%. Um, age less than 18 at time of IPAA, um, male gender and presence of gastric adenomas, according to authors, you know, appear to be independent risk factors. Uh, the risk, uh, the change of study was that um, the patient sample came from a high volume specialized institution with very thorough and protocolized surveillance and follow-up, including the ability to extract information on mutational analyses. Um, however, you know, other than a few clinical variables, with this study was not able to comment on potential genetic variations that could lead to a pouch adenomas as a phenotype. Um, certainly there were also no preoperative um, data um, uh, described in the study. And uh, this, the patient population only relates to a single European center, but presumably this genetic disease shouldn't have an effect on the, um, the risk factors. Um, overall, um, I think the take home point is that pouch adenomas will affect the majority of patients with FAP after IPAA and endoscopic surveillance of the pouch should be instituted and that guidelines for management of these pouch adenomatoses are needed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Glasgow. Um, right. So Jeff, that was a nice, uh, very nice summary there. I, I really like this study. I think it's, it's interesting in a couple of ways. It's very thought provoking. And I was sitting here trying to think how else would you do a study like this besides a, a retrospective cohort like, like they did at a single center. I can't really think of a better study design where you can still get the granularity, you know, the details like excluding the anal transition zone, uh, the detailed follow-up, the number of patients who progress and so forth. So I think it really kind of shows the power of, of centralized expert centers to, to manage these rare disease processes and give us good long-term follow-up. You know, I've, a couple of things I would point out in the paper, even with their protocol of, of surveillance, the, the median time after IPAA was 10 years, but the median number of endoscopy was on, only eight. So obviously there's some patients who are escaping regular annual surveillance, even at a center like this with protocols in place. And the other thing that was really eye-opening to me was the 36% progression rate. So annual endoscopy, presumably clearing the pouch of adenomas and still over a third of patients are gonna progress uh, on interval studies. So I think that really shows the, the importance that the, the surveillance has. Um, so Jeff, what do you think in terms of fitting this with some other literature in terms of uh, long-term pouch loss from dysplasia or invasive malignancy in patients with FAP who have undergone restorative proctoplectomy? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Glasgow. Um, so, you know, as this paper, paper alluded to, previous data on this, you know, have been sparse and with small cohort size. There is one um, uh, somewhat uh, moderately sized study uh, from a Dutch group using the, um, the Dutch polyposis registry uh, with similar number of patients that quoted a, a pouch loss rate about 6% uh, with a 1% to 2% risk of carcinoma um, at a median about eight years. Uh, in this particular paper, um, in, in this study that we just presented, um, although the, uh, the authors did not comment on pouch loss rate, uh, they did uh, say that, you know, about uh, one patient did develop carcinoma in the pouch during follow-up. So um, presumably the pouch loss rate is about, you know, six to 10% range with one to 2% risk of carcinoma. But um, I'm happy to take any uh, comments on that, you know, in terms of uh, other people's experiences. Paul, what, what do you tell your patients in terms of doing a restorative proctocolectomy their chance of, of losing that, not due to function or technical problems, but due to malignancy. Yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I think as Jeff is alluding to is, is relatively rare and to some degree, it also depends on appropriate surveillance. I, I have routinely uh, surveilled my pouch patients every year, sometimes two years, um, but have, have been pretty aggressive. And as this paper alludes to, the, the further out you get from your pouch creation, 
uh, the more you start to see uh, pouch polyposis develop. And in this study, they had some that were developing polyps within a year of their pouch, uh, but the majority of them were developing them later. And obviously, as we just had the 40th anniversary of the uh, 1978 kind of initial uh, pouches, which were mainly S pouches that were created then, and then kind of uh, the J pouch then ended up um, uh, really kind of taking over as, as we all know, technically easier than the S. Um, it is, it's been notable to see how many more of these patients have had better longevity and therefore we're seeing more, more of these polyps develop. Um, and certainly with, from our FAP experience here, uh, we've seen, I'm seeing more and more of these folks and, and a lot of these trials that have come out recently that are looking at chemo prevention agents to try to help us uh, save pouches and, and hopefully also have an impact on the upper GI polyps, which it's, it's quite notable. I mean, the way they presented their stats in, in the one table, uh, table two, um, they had kind of uh, done the percentages a little bit different than I would have presented them, but 90% of their patients with uh, pouch adenomas had, uh, or excuse me, 90%, yes, 90% uh, of the patients have pouch adenomas had duodenal adenomas as well. So their phenotype tends to be fairly aggressive um, in these patients. And so it's not really a surprise that they're also manifesting that in their, uh, in their uh, pouch as well. So I think it'll be, it'll be nice. And hopefully as we're starting to see some of these studies bear fruit um, uh, with those like the recent DFMO uh, paper and, and hopefully some of the ones uh, that are ongoing from Janssen and other groups, we'll, we'll see some ways to be able to hopefully avoid um, actually having to do pouch uh, excisions uh, most of the time I find the folks that develop can cancers are usually de developing them more at the anal transition zone than they are within the pouch themselves. And uh, certainly the ability to reconstruct a pouch and salvage a pouch in those patients is much less. It'll be interesting to hear what, uh, what James thinks as well. Um, just to follow up on that, in terms of chemo prophylaxis, um, do you give Solendac or anything like that? Um, and if so, when do you start that? Yeah, so I, I'm relatively aggressive with those agents, and I've, I've certainly had some patients who have been lost to follow-up and have come back with pretty impressive uh, uh, pouch polyps uh, that I have seen impressive results. But the concern about uh, use of those uh, chemo prevention agents is, and I don't know if they've been studied specifically in pouches versus what we've seen in the colons, uh, but they don't prevent cancer development. So you still have to be very vigilant with these patients and, and be and, and biopsy extensively to make sure they don't already have high grade dysplasia or cancer uh, that have developed. But I do start them at 150 BID, uh, see if they can tolerate that and see if they get um, a response from it uh, all the while continuing their surveillance. So it doesn't avoid the surveillance and it's also not effective with their upper GI polyps. And so what this paper shows as we can see, is that a lot of these patients also have proximal GI polyps that you have to be vigilant about as well. Um, and so uh, it, it, the uh, straight Solendac, at least what we've seen in the studies, is not uh, effective for those. There's probably some processing of the, of the medication itself that has to occur, which may be why the combination with DFMO have, has had some success with the upper GI polyps. So a question is in the chat about pouchitis and risk of developing dysplasia following multiple episodes of pouchitis. You know, again, looking at table two in this paper, uh, the incidence of pouchitis was almost exactly the same in the, in the patients with and without adenomas. Um, you know, in my limited experience in scoping patients after restorative proctocolectomy, uh, if they have significant pouchitis, they can get almost a cobblestoning or a, a pseudopolyp appearance. But, but they, they aren't true adenomas necessarily. And, and I don't know, Dr. Church, if you have any other thoughts on that or, or Paul. I noticed that <clears throat> reference to pouchitis as well. And um, we have just had a paper accepted by DCNR saying that pouchitis never develops in our experience in FAP patients. Yeah, I was impressed with how common it was in this study. So I, I think it goes to the definition of, quote, pouchitis, unquote, and it seems to be histologic. And we know that chronic inflammation is a normal finding in all uh, ileal pouches. So um, I just have a big question mark over that. It's, and because it was not significantly different, it doesn't contribute to the study. 
James, are, any other comments about kind of your approach to surveillance of these use of chemo prevention um, and ability to avoid, you know, how, how best to salvage these pouches, especially as the polyposis becomes more extensive? As you said, Paul, the early surveillance is aimed at the anal transition zone um, because that is already, that's basically rectal mucosa and it's already primed for neoplasia and quite often there's already a, a polyp when you actually make the pouch. Um, as the years go by, then the focus becomes equally on the pouch itself. And it seems as if some patients never form a pouch adenoma and others form lots and lots and lots. Um, I noticed in this paper that they applied a, a version of the Spiegelman criteria to try and look at severity, but I didn't see any data on that. It was a little frustrating. But in our experience, we have had some patients with carpeted uh, pouches, just carpeted with adenomas. So clearly you cannot deal with that endoscopically. So the only hope is chemo prevention or take the pouch out. Um, we've used Solendac with some good effect on the short term. As you said, it's always a bit concerning about the long term. Uh, and I'm just hoping to use this combination of DFMO and Solendac in these badly affected pouches and see if there's a chance of saving them. Thank you. Um, I'd like to diverge a little bit away from the paper, but talk about pouches in FAP. And my question is in relation to fertility um, and pouches. Um, now, if you have a young lady with FAP, um, do you discuss this in the clinic with them? Yeah, I, I certainly do. Um, if we're considering doing a, a ileal pouch, uh, if they if if their phenotype is requiring excision of it, and whether you know we can certainly get into the work that has been done at Cleveland Clinic related to uh, desmoids and uh, laparoscopy versus open, and kind of how to approach it. Uh, but certainly fecundity, as we all know, is a potential issue related to um, to the creation of an ileal pouch. Uh, and scar tissue formation and, and theoretically the trapped ovarian syndrome um, that can impact their ability to get pregnant. And so uh, it's absolutely a discussion that I, that I have uh, with, with my female patients, just as I uh, talk about the potential for, um, for uh, we all know, the pelvic dissection and the impact on male fertility as well. So. And going further, if, if they are successful in being pregnant and they proceed to needing a delivery um, the balance of desmoids versus pouch injury, incontinence, that kind of stuff. What is there a um, a decision making in terms of what's safer, a C-section or a natural vaginal delivery? We have to remember in the states, like everyone gets a C-section anyway, right? I mean, it's uh, it it it's certainly impressive the number of uh, folks who get C-sections, which has hopefully preserved many a sphincter, both in patients without uh, pouches and those with. Um, I, I always kind of refer it back to the OBGYNs and have them uh, have them do what's going to be safest for for mom and for baby. Um, I, I am not one to uh, be prescriptive about having to do C sections related to ileal pouches. I'd be interested to know what my partners do under that circumstance um, if they've got someone like that, and whether it's for IBD or FAP. <clears throat> excuse me. I don't think quite as much about the the desmoid risk. Uh, down, um, you know, related to say an episiotomy or the impact of that. Uh, and certainly the hormonal milieu has an impact on desmoid formation, um, uh, but I, I, don't, I don't get quite as uh, worked up about that. I don't, uh, Matt, do you do anything in particular with your pouch patients about recommendations for, um, for uh, maintaining uh, continence or uh, sphincter integrity? I mean, you know, I think I, I give them the option, but you also, I mean, I think, highlighting the fact that they do have a significant risk of having issues of incontinence and particularly if they end up with a fourth degree tear then you've got a complex pouch reconstruction to, to do so i tend to favor c-section radica do you do anything yeah i think i um make sure sorry one second just um, make sure that the patient is aware again about the risk for post-operative incontinence or post-delivery incontinence and um, trauma to their uh, sphincter complex. And then you just want to highlight to the OB 
uh, the baby size and what the risk factors are. Also, if she's had a baby before, um, that will all also help decrease the risk of additional trauma. But I do offer or let, let them have the option of vaginal delivery. Yeah, Sean, how about you? Sorry, I lost my mouse there. Um, no, I, yeah, I favor C-sections in general, uh, mostly in the patients who I've done pouches in with IBD, uh, because I think that would be a catastrophic injury if, if they do get a grade four and um, perhaps unsalvageable. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I guess... I'm sorry, I had one sorry? other point to raise on the paper, and I, I again would like Dr. Church's take on this. Um, the discussion hints about uh, preserving the rectum in patients without significant rectal adenomas because the adenoma risk is uh, very similar in those patients to those who develop a pouch in the long term. At least that's kind of what they hint at. Uh, would you consider that, Dr. Church, leaving the rectum in place and, and doing surveillance there in a patient with FAP? Oh, yeah. I mean, not only consider it, I think it's our favorite operation to do because it offers a much better quality of life, especially in young patients, and it avoids a stoma. So, yes. And I think we published on this some time ago and uh, uh, suggested using 20 rectal adenomas as a threshold for doing a pouch. So if there's less than 20, then it's okay to leave the rectum. And our data using that uh, threshold uh, were very good in terms of patients needing uh, subsequent proctectomy. So if you had less than 20 adenomas, that was very uncommon. If you had more than 20, then the odds of you having your rectum taken out later were quite high. Um, not, you know, I, I think we're even pushing it to like have it doing a stage pouch. So imagine an 18 year old girl um, who has a family history of desmoids, but really needs an operation. Um, we would entertain the notion of doing an IRA to start with, knowing that we may have to take her rectum out when she's 25 or 30, but that she probably would have had a chance to have babies before then. She would at least have had a chance to get married and have established a career. So there are more to decision-making than just numbers of adenomas. The other thing you know, I would say related to that is they're doing 192 pouches in three years. Um, so that's a lot of pouches, and I think there are some centers, and the Germans may be one of them, that do pouches on everybody. So you come in with four adenomas, and FAP, you get a pouch. Um, and they have a relatively low rate of pouch adenomas. It may, it may relate to <clears throat> that they weren't that severely affected to start with. Hmm. Interesting. Um, thank you. A any other questions from the audience? Okay. Um, perhaps then we'll proceed to the next um, next poll and the next um, and then the next paper. So All right, next so the slide, next poll. please. Margaret, would you go forward one more slide? We could do the poll without it, but I'm gonna go ahead and launch the poll. For the next poll, we have, would you, do you routinely retroflex in the cecum during uh, colonoscopies? Always, if I suspect to sessile serrated adenoma with a history of SSA, never or other. Okay, good. And whilst that's running, um, let's proceed to the next slide. Um, and so we'll, we'll kindly get Dr. Lowe to present the paper and, and then Dr. Smith to subsequently provide us some critique. Thank you both. All right. Uh, so the paper I'm presenting is entitled uh, Sessile Serrated Polyposis, Not Inherited Syndrome. Uh, this, the, uh, the uh, senior author on this was Dr. James Church. Next slide. All right, so uh, just a little bit of background on um, you know, serrated polyps. So overall, serrated polyp subtypes include hyper, hyperplastic polyps, 
sessile serrated lesions and traditional serrated adenomas, um, serrated polyposis syndrome. Um, the WHO criteria were revised in 2019 and currently consist of two separate subtypes. So type one um, is uh, greater than five serrated polyps proximal to the sigmoid in at least two measuring 10 millimeters. And um, type three, which I guess is actually the original type three and more and, and currently characterizes type two is greater than 20 serrated polyps of any size um, in any location. Uh, both of these are associated with an increased risk of personal and family history of colorectal cancer. And overall, the, the genotype is um, relatively unclear. They are characterized by activating mutations in BRAF and KRAS proto-oncogenes, and there is an association with DNA hypermethylation. Um, so this study was a single institution cohort study um, involving a prospectively maintained database. They compared patients with WHO type 1 um, to patients with uh, single uh, sessile serrated lesions. So overall, they have 46 patients uh, with uh, serrated polyposis and 323 patients with uh, uh, single sessile serrated lesions. Next slide. So the, the characteristics of this um, cohort, the, the median age at uh, diagnosis for, um, for these patients was 62 years, um, a, a slight predominance in women, 59%. Um, and there was a higher incidence of tobacco use in those with uh, sessile serrated polyposis. It was also associated with an increase in the total number of polyps, that was 26 versus 4.4 in those with ses single sessile serrated lesions. Um, there was an increased rate of synchronous adenomas, 71 versus 55%. There was a higher rate of dysplasia, which was present in 20% of patients with serrated polyposis. Um, there was an increased family history of colorectal cancers in 32% of those with serrated polyposis versus 14% um, of those with just single sessile serrated lesions, and an increased uh, personal history of colorectal cancer. Um, there is also an increased risk of um, other malignancies within the family, most notably um, breast um, and prostate, but as you can see there in the lower left corner, um, there was a wide range of other um, associated malignancies. Um, next slide. So um, the, uh, as we kind of alluded to at the beginning, um, there's two kind of distinct um, phenotypes and, and each of those is somewhat associated with a, a relatively distinct um, genotype as well. So the WHO type one is, um, you know, the, the right side of larger polyps. Um, these are more frequently associated with BRAF mutations and the CPG island um, hypermethylation. And the, the origin of these BRAF mutations is, is unknown at this point. Um, there's kind of question of whether there's a role in the microbiome or the stool, given that they're predominantly right-sided. Um, and, you know, the association with um, smoking in terms of, you know, potentially an environmental um, association. Um, the RNF43 variants, which codes ring finger protein 43, which has a role in DNA damage response, was pre is present in 87% of lesions um, that, that harbor BRAF mutations and microsatellite instability versus only 4% in the wild type. Um, although these are typically sporadic based on current, um, current information. So the WHO type three um, or hyperplastic polyposis um, is often associated with the KRAS mutations. Now in this study, um, 10 of the 46 um, serrated polyposis patients ultimately underwent genetic testing. And in those 10, uh, four patients had no mutations identified um, and uh, the other mutations that were ultimately identified included a patient with MSH2 um, mutation, one P10 mutation, and one CHECK2 variant. Um, and there was, a, there was a high rate of overlap with other genetic syndromes, um, which are listed there. Um, next slide. Uh, so the paper went on to kind of outline, you know, the, the, how, how these are managed um, at this point. Um, which kind of goes along with their findings. So the genetic testing, if greater than five sessile serrated polyps 
um, with two greater than one centimeter. Um, colonoscopy every one to three years. Um, unresectable polyps with a manageable polyp burden um, would be considered for a segmental colectomy, while those with large polyp burdens, synchronous cancers, or poor compliance um, at the institution are traditionally um, considered for a total abdominal colectomy. Excellent presentation, Kayla. Thank you. So um, I think as colorectal surgeons, the majority of us are much more uh, familiar with the adenoma to carcinoma sequence. So I'm just going to go over a little bit of the basics. Uh, Kayla touched on a lot of it. Um, but sessile or serrated polyps include hyperplastic polyps, sessile serrated adenomas, and the traditional serrated adenomas, as he mentioned. They're going to be flat and slightly raised and usually are going to occur on the right side of the colon, and that makes them more difficult to detect during colonoscopy. Um, because of this, they will account for a disproportionate amount of integral cancers. So we know that these polyps do confer some sort of risk of malignancy, but this exact risk is unclear. We think it's around 20 to 40 percent. Um, and it can account for a third of colorectal cancers. Um, generally speaking, as he mentioned, they should be managed similarly to adenomas. So um, we know that uh, these pathways are different, but we're not exactly sure um, what the genetic variants are associated with it, and that was the exact uh, purpose of this study. So the WHO has come up with criteria that Kayla reviewed to um, define the different types of uh, the serrated polyposis syndrome. Um, in the majority of patients with SPS, you're not gonna have a causative gene identified. Um, and this study looks specifically at those WHO uh, type one patients. And um, they found that, you know, those specific risk of high-grade dysplasia with, a, uh, they all have a higher risk for high-grade dysplasia. Um, they had a higher risk of smoking, larger polyp burden, the extra intestinal cancers, family history, and the uh, um, significant overall cancer risk. So that really suggests, and why this paper was so important, was there's something there. You know, just because we can't determine the exact gene, we need to really try to parse through um, as our genetic testing continues to improve and figure out what is creating this disordered growth, um, you know, genetically, and then also is there some environmental or familial association, such as smoking. Um, so, Kaylor, how do you uh, plan to manage these patients when you come to practice if they fit this WHO criteria? This is actually so appropriately timed because my uh, good friend from residency is currently practicing in Japan with the Navy not five minutes ago texted me and said, oh, I just scoped a patient with a serrated polyp. Do I need to do a right colectomy? Um, <laughs> So um, I think, you know, the, the takeaway is, is um, you know, you, you know, in, in, in a way you treat them somewhat like adenomas in terms of, you know, how you're, you're not going to just, you know, do a colectomy on somebody just because they have a serrated polyp. Um, you know, there is a, an association with, um, you know, other, you know, inheritable, um, you know, conditions. So I think germline testing uh, is important. And then you manage them kind of based on the presence of either, you know, display, you know, dysplasia, or malignancy, and their polyp burden. So, you know, you want to, you know, scope them more frequently, have a, um, you know, and be able to, to provide them with, you know, high quality surveillance. And then you, you based your kind of management based on your findings on those, you know, frequent colonoscopies in terms of the need for resection and, um, you know, um, the extent of resection. Great. What, what about their family members? Uh, and then also, yeah, of course, uh, screening family members, which as they showed, you know, have a higher incidence of, you know, other associated malignancies and colorectal cancer. So I think, you know, counseling them on those risks and making sure they really kind of understand the, the those risks for themselves and the family members. Fantastic. Um, I, I have a I have a question. So, if we differ, if we're aiming to differentiate um, uh, sort of these uh, phenotypes into right-sided and left-sided, how can this information be of benefit to us? Uh, one of the poll that we formed was in relation to retroflexion, for example. Is there an argument to do that, or say, do narrow band imaging for? 
um, the patients who we think has a have a right-sided phenotype, and conversely, patients who have a left-sided phenotype, older patients with diverticular disease. I personally get really challenged by clearing the sigmoid colon in someone who has uh, muscular hypertrophy. Uh, should we consider giving them glucagon or something that may relax their bowel? Would that would that help? Um, please, anyone in the faculty, <laughs> if they have any ideas on this. So I think ultimately, sorry, I'm having some audio issues. I think ultimately, um, you just essentially have to do what you need to do to do a good colonoscopy. So um, and make sure that you're doing split dose prep, that um, you are clearly seeing everything that you need to see using narrow band imaging when indicated. Um, and uh, high definition scopes and um, making sure that when you do encounter polyps that they're clear appropriately and your surveillance is up to date. Um, and if you can't do that for whatever reason, then they should can consider cross-sectional imaging like CT colonography, although that has its own issues. But um, I think ultimately, if you feel comfortable doing a, you know, clearing the right side of the colon without doing sequel retroflexion, I think that that's appropriate, just as long as you truly are seeing everything behind every fold and um, not leaving any uh, uh, part of the mucosa unexamined. I think something that, um, that I've learned from the work that uh, James and a lot of his colleagues have done uh, is, is that being careful about how you surveil um, I haven't been quite as excited about retroflexion, but watching for these mucus-capped lesions, as soon as you irrigate out that area, they can be really difficult to identify. And so really paying close attention. I have not been as excited about narrowband imaging to be able to better differentiate. Sometimes chroma endoscopy, I think, can help us a little bit uh, to be able to delineate. But much like with adenomatous polyposis, you know, these small microscopic lesions are not the things we're really worried about. It's It's these larger uglier lesions. And, and certainly, uh, you know, I'd be interested in hearing specifically about the particular cases uh, that were highlighted in this paper with the three patients that presented with cancers, uh, luckily at an early stage, but they were um, cancers nonetheless. It seemed like they were undergoing appropriate surveillance. Um, and so it, it, to me, kind of highlights how scary these lesions can be um, that they can just kind of spring out of nowhere. Um, and I, I don't know as these were lesions potentially that had been hiding behind a fold that may have been caught uh, on uh, retroflexion. Um, but certainly you worry about the potential consequences of retroflexion and obviously not all patients are, are uh, amenable to it. Uh, when it's that, I happen to mark other on the poll not to give away my answer, but to say if I can easily do it, I will try to do it. But uh, I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, spend an enormous amount of time trying to um, do it, and especially if you got someone with a redundant left colon, it can be really hard to retroflex in the right. Um, so, thank you. Um, I see there's a comment from Dr. Cologne about um, the GI Society recommendations, um, either retroflexion or scoping the ascending colon twice. What What do you do, Dr. Church? Uh, <clears throat> so, I think the issue with the CSL serrated lesions is image recognition. So. When most of us do colonoscopy, we have a picture of an adenoma in our mind. We need to try and add a picture of a sessile serrated lesion in our mind so that when we see that, we instinctively stop and recognize it and say there's something fishy here. Having said that, they are extremely subtle at times. Um, but the big ones, the ones that are likely to have um, high-grade dysplasia and be pre-malignant, they're usually not those subtle little ones. Um, uh, they're usually two or three centimeters in diameter, um, but they look kind of yellowish because of the bile stained mucus. Um, they're flat and they're soft, and you may think that it's just mucus. Um, so, but it's image recognition that's the key. Um, while I'm talking, can I just speak to the paper a little bit and say that the reason for doing this study was sitting in the CGA or insight meetings and hearing the scientists go on and on about looking for a gene for serrated polyposis and not coming up with one and spending vast amounts of money and grants and time looking for a gene in a, you can call it a syndrome, that actually is not inherited, that there is no constitutional mutation other than the 
like four families, I think, with an RNF43 variant that has been inherited in the family, a, a tiny percentage. But most of them, it's an epigenetic phenomenon of hypermethylation in the right colon that follows a BRAF mutation. Um, and that causes aggressive neoplasia, not only in serrated polyps, but also in adenomas. And in fact, uh, most of the cancers that arise in the syndrome arise in adenomas. So a methylated adenoma is much more aggressive than a non-methylated adenoma. And in fact, two of, or th all three of the patients with cancer in this series happened within uh, a year and a half of their previous colonoscopy. Uh, and they arose in adenomas um, that, as uh, Paul said, was stage one. So uh, it is a scary syndrome. Uh, it, it's um, ne neoplasia on steroids, and it's due to this hypermethylation. The thing about hypermethylation, I think, is that it can knock out two copies of a gene at once. So normally with a tumor suppressor gene, you knock out one copy and you have to lose the other copy later the methylation can knock out both copies at once. And so instantly that gene is not working. Instantly there's nothing stopping that growth um, stimulating pathway. Thank you. Um, that, that, that's very, um, very interesting. Now, I think most of us um, have scoped patients and most of us have found that there's a cancer after we've scoped a patient and it's incredibly frustrating. Um, and, um, and I certainly feel quite bad about that, although I think I've done my best. Now, if you receive a colonoscopy that someone else has done, what are the markers that make you worry that this colonoscopy maybe has not been done um, with the same degree of detail that you would like to have done it yourself and therefore would, um, sort of um, challenge you to do it earlier than the set three, five, whatever years. I'd, I'd be interested to hear what Dr. Much thinks about that in terms of when you get an outside referral, kind of when you when you decide not only when you're going to do your surveillance, but wh who do you repeat uh, when you get them, especially if they're sent to you, say, with, with this syndrome, uh, are you going to repeat it automatically or just go ahead and operate or, uh, or what? Uh, I mean, I think that you know you're going to want some sort of sense of really what the what the burden is. So I think my bias is to to look for myself. I think that surveillance wise, long term, you know, you got to send them back to the to the GI guy. But I think that if you're going to make a decision, I'd like to see sort of what the what the burden is for myself. And conversely, or sorry, what are the matters of quality? What was when it? you scope, what, what do you make? What, what are your key performance indicators? <clears throat> well, I mean, I think obviously, I mean, sequel intubation, your withdrawal time, and you know, you just you have to make sure that you've got, you know, as Jim pointed out, these can be very subtle. So you, you know, your quality of prep really has even a greater impact on sort of what your quality of scope is going to be. Okay, thank you. Um, the other question I have um, is actually, um, I noticed that Christy Cooley was, um, was in the audience. She's the um, first author on this paper. Um, very grateful for her to attend. Um, and just changing, the, changing a little bit um, the hat of the, and the questions, um, in the relation to submitting this patient to DCR, um, what do you think works well and what do you think can be improved, Christy? So for this particular, uh, for this paper? Yep. Um, so I think that the, um, the biggest limitation for this study was that uh, we did not have genetic panel testing on all of the patients. Um, with, we just have it for a limited sample. So, um, you know, perhaps if we had been able to um, have genetic testing on more of the patients, um, in addition to the fact that we hadn't done the RNF testing, 
Um, I do think that the, uh, so that I guess would be the, the biggest limitation that I would say um, is being able to have, you know, panels on, uh, on all the patients. Um, one of the, uh, <laughs> I like your, uh, your comment, Dr. Wise. Um, That's exactly, yeah. I was like, oh boy, we're gonna answer this question. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that that you know the biggest strength was really going through the pedigrees, um, you know, looking at the the smoking status, which um, you know was recorded as as you know uh, thoroughly as, as we could in the clinic notes, um, and that's why I think you know having these series with the granular data is is so great. Um, so you can actually go back and look at some of these environmental factors as well, um, which uh, you know again when you think of the concurrent. Uh, breast and prostate cancer um, is obviously something to, to consider when, as Dr. Church was saying, there are so many resources being, you know, put into um, trying to find out a, a cause uh, for these. So counseling the patients to stop smoking um, is important. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any, any other points about this paper or should we, in the interest of time, move on? All right, um, let's, let's go to the next slide, please. Right, the most exciting part of the event. <laughs> so I'm gonna go ahead and share, I'll, I'll do these in, uh, in reverse order since this is the relevant to the second paper. Do you retroflex in the cecum during colonoscopy? I, I'm not allowed to vote, so this would have been, you know, 63 or 4%. Uh, I also do not retroflex, but uh, it was certainly the preponderance of people. We have a couple of people who do, obviously. Dr. Burke is on um, the call. Perhaps she's one of the ones who always retroflexes. Can I speak? Sure. Of course. Oh, hi. I am that lonely gastroenterologist, maybe, that's attending your journal club. So thank you very much. It's very, it's a great forum and um, so, so appreciative to see you, all of my friends, and hear from Dr. Church. Um, so I think in the era where we're spending much more than six minutes on withdrawal time and, and at the Cleveland Clinic, we see a lot of hereditary colon cancer patients, um, you know, that our withdrawal times are, you know, north of 15 minutes. So I, I don't retroflex in the cecum, although when I um, have a tricky polyp in the right colon, then I will retroflex to lift it and make sure that it's completely removed. But I just, I use narrow band imaging virtually on, on every case um, because you will be stunned and data shows that you will pick up your at least adenoma detection rate. Um, and there's some guidelines, I think the European Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy that re actually recommend um, narrow band imaging um, or or actual chromoendoscopy in individuals with Lynch syndrome, they also get um, SSLs. So I, I always use um, narrow band imaging because I find that it's very helpful unless the prep is poor. Um, and you'll be stunned at what you can pick up that's not really seen. And the other thing that I wanna encourage you guys that are doing colonoscopy is to use uh, water insufflation um, because water magnifies things and I'm picking up a ton of stuff when I'm when I have water immersion. So that's another technique that can enhance your ability to detect lesions, especially in high risk patients. Carol, so much Susan Glandia here. So much appreciate your attending our journal club. A question for you: What do you ensure that these patients have a good bowel preparation? Because, as some people mentioned, that really is essential when you're trying to pick up fine detail. Thank you, Susan. Absolutely. And I'm sorry, I'm not dressed for the journal club. Everyone looks so nice. And I was, <laughs> I'm on hospital service. So I came home and I'm writing my notes and grabbed a quick dinner. Um, so actually, Dr. Church is, you know, he's a maven and he's an innovator. So uh, the, the international standard is a split bowel preparation, which doesn't mean, you know, you drink some at noon, you drink some at, at 6 p.m., but it's actually um, getting half the bowel preparation the night before and the other half the day off to get the succus entericus that, that, you know, that is coming into the right colon overnight. However, um, same day prep, right? So if you have an afternoon procedure and you can get it all in at least four hours before your procedure, then that is probably better than night before and day of. So the point is the runway time. Um, the, it should be no more than four hours after you finish your last dose of preparation. But I'd like Dr. Church to comment on it because he uses a strategy where he actually preps patients the night before and then gives them emodium. And James has written a study on that. So split dose, 
or single dose, um, you know, same day of the procedure, unless you're going to use the church method, and maybe James could speak to that. Um, sure. I, um, I agree with the split, though. So it depends when the patient's appointment is. So if it's early in the morning, uh, then they can prep the night before. If it's late morning, around lunchtime, then it's a split. If it's the afternoon, then it's the, um, the morning of. But several years ago, 2011, I think we published a paper in DCNR looking at the role of four milligrams of Imodium after their last bowel movement before their examination. But the idea that it would slow down the bile in the small intestine and prevent it from, or allow you to get into the cecum and inspect the cecum before that bile arrived. Because sticky bile in the cecum means trouble and especially identifying serrated polyps. So we did a prospective randomized study of that and it, it confirmed the fact that four milligrams of Imodium will help. Uh, we, the cecum was significantly more clean in the group that got the Imodium and there were no side effects. So the time to the first bowel movement was exactly the same. We did find more patients with multiple polyps in the Imodium group. So it had a clinical benefit as well. And, it's a pain in the neck to prescribe four milligrams of Imodium to all my colonoscopy patients. And that's a lot of patients, uh, but I think it's worth it. And so I still do it. You can't just have them pick it up over the counter, James. You would think that would be good, yes, but no, <laughs> no. Um, just a question about equipment. Um, and I kind of know what Dr. Church's answer to this may be, but um, the pros and cons of pediatric versus adult colonoscopes, and if that affects um, both intubation rate and surveillance rate. Um, maybe Dr. Wise, um, yeah, what, what, do you, what do you guys do? Uh, well, I'll tell you, I, I don't use the pediatric colonoscope unless I'm having issues or I know um, that the patient's going to have a relatively narrow colon or a little bit difficult because I find it's you you lose a lot of that um, uh, a lot of the mobility uh, especially in some of the more torturous uh, colons and so uh, so I I don't tend to use it as much I certainly know some of our GI colleagues here favor using the pediatric colonoscope on a lot of their uh, patients uh, but I, I tend to have a lot of uh, kind of uh, floppy looping colons that I find by the time I get over to the right colon, I have a little bit harder time uh, with the pediatric colonoscope and getting the leverage I need to be able to, to get around uh, unless they've got other issues that are making it more difficult uh, in the left colon. I don't, Matt, do you do anything different? <clears throat> no, same. I don't know. Sean, Radhika, do you guys... Um, yeah, so I have um, set small hands and that's some of the benefit of using a pediatric colonoscope is it might be a little bit lighter and a little bit easier to handle, but I still use an adult colonoscope routinely unless things are narrow and I'm having a hard time getting through. But I do find that it's very helpful if you have that, you know, muscular hypertrophy that was uh, referenced earlier to try to get through when things seem difficult in the sick point. Dr. Church or Dr. Burke, do you, do you concur? I use the pediatric uh, colonoscope routinely, um, but I, I think it depends on how much sedation you're going to give the patient. So um, my sedation level it varies between zero and about 20% of patients to two to four milligrams of Versed, and that's all. So um, the exam has to be somewhat gentle. It has to reduce loops at all costs. And the best way to do that, I think, is with the pediatric colonoscope. So... I used to use adult scopes and I found I was exchanging them for pediatric colonoscopes increasingly. And so I just went to use pediatric colonoscopes all the time and I don't find them to be a disadvantage. Dr. Burke, thank you. Thank you. Um, I was trained using intermediate adult scopes and every time I, I use one, I love it, but I my practice is women with Lynch syndrome that have had hysterectomy, difficult colonoscopies that other people outside the institution, you know, cannot, um, cannot get around. Um, 
So I always use a pediatric colonoscope. Um, and at times when it's very difficult to get around because of a fixed colon, um, I will switch to an upper endoscope, but generally my practice is pediatric uh, colonoscopes, which our um, data has shown is more effective in women and um, you know, probably less effective in you know, men with a lot of uh, body fat who could tolerate an adult scope. Uh, one caution is I would never retroflex in the right colon if you're using adult colonoscopes because those, those are the times it's associated with perforation. So only do it with a pediatric scope. Thank you. Um, the other poll um, that we have is about mental health and FAP, um, which is um, based on the, um, uh, the paper we had this month. Um, and uh, Stephen? Um, yeah, go ahead and bring that up. Okay. Yeah, so we, um, you know, the so there was a pretty good split. And then the, the winner currently was I offer a specialist consultation based on the patient's kind of preferences. Um, and then, you know, following that were either I, you know, haven't really thought about it or I do it when the patient requests the, uh, 17% only six people have this as an integrated part of their pathway, which, you know, certainly is a relatively small number. We only had like 36 answers for this. So. Hmm. I, I guess it probably calls for. Um, again, for having a um, centralized hereditary cancer database where you can uh, you, you can form a better um, pathway for these people. But I'd be interested to see in in Wash U, do you guys um, do you guys have an integrated um, mental health um, expert that you send these people to, or do you think it's a good idea? Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have anyone who's in our clinics. I mean, we have a hard enough time, you know, getting uh, genetic counselors to be able to uh, be in our clinics, much less the psychological support. Uh, so we we have not had uh, ready access to that, unfortunately. I, I would suspect most institutions do not have that naturally built into their uh, colorectal clinics. I do know that some have that in their IBD clinics, and so there may be uh, ability to kind of cross over um, with, uh, with having this available to these patients, but certainly it's, it's not surprising that, uh, that they have, uh, issues that could, that could benefit from that without a doubt. I do think our genetic counselors, especially, uh, in our pediatrics group have, have better access, ready access to, um, mental health support for those patients and families. I don't know if my partners have any other different experience, but I know they're not embedded in our clinics. That's for sure. We do have um, a good network through Sight and Cancer Center of patients with colorectal cancer, but not specifically for uh, patients with FAP. Um, uh, is, is Brandy Leach on the line? Yeah, um, I'm here. Hi, th thank you. Um, thank you for attending. Um, just um, if you can summarize what you do and, and what is your take on this? Yeah, so as genetic counselors, we, we certainly do assess and speak with patients about mental health issues and psychological issues that arise through the genetic testing process and in association with having hereditary colorectal cancer syndromes. But I think genetic counselors are probably much better poised to identify patients who are really struggling and refer them on to psychologists and work with the psychologist as part of a team rather than truly filling that counseling role. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Church, do you have any comments on this or should we, should we all move on to the next segment in the interest of time? Well, I, I think if everybody's read the paper, then fine, but just to mention the highlights, so that out of a hundred patients that we asked um, if they had any of a series of 20 mental health symptoms. Um, 72 uh, expressed at least one, and the average was four. Uh, the most important aspect of the study, I think, was that there was a subgroup of patients, 18 of them, that had a syndrome that was like PTSD. And when you think about FAP, there's prime candidates for that because they get repeated surgeries, repeated complications, and repeated threats to life. And so 
you can just picture a patient coming in for another operation on a desmoid bowel obstruction and she could die from that and um, oh no, not again. And every time they get an appointment to see Dr. Church, it's a cue to have some sort of mental reaction. Um, of the six patients in the series that had expressed suicidal thoughts, all of them had these PTSD-like uh, syndromes. So some patients are severely affected mentally, severely affected, and they desperately need help. Um, hopefully we can ourselves as clinicians recognize this, uh, certainly in the severe ones. Um, for example, another example is we had a family uh, where the father's wife died of FAP and now the children were coming in and being screened for FAP. And every time he brought the children in, he would start weeping. Um, and so that's a man who doesn't have FAP himself. He's been traumatized by the disease. He needs help. It's not good for the children to see their father weeping every time they come in for their colonoscopy. So um, we just need to be aware of it and be prepared to get the resources to take action so we can help these patients. Thank you. Um, okay, so let, let's, um, unless anyone has any more comments, let's move on to the next segment, please. Um, and the next segment is, um, uh, Margaret, if you can skip ahead, please. Um, next slide. Next, seg next segment really is, um, is our special guest segment. And um, I've been fortunate to work for Dr. Church and write a few papers with him. And I kind of likened it to training with Usain Bolt. And, and you know, you can do all the training you want. You're never really going to be that fast. Um, and so anyway, um, it was a great experience and certainly um whilst uh, congratulations on on your retirement i think that's going to be a huge loss to to the world colorectal community um my first question um and this is kind of a bit of a transition from what uh, dr weiss mentioned um you have brought us some amazing manuscript titles um open sesame tips of traversing the anal canals probably my favorite Open Sesame Revisited, Polishing the Crystal Ball. There's quite a few. Um, what do you think makes a good title for a paper? Well, I think the first thing is it has to accurately reflect what's in the paper. Um, because the readers, the first thing they see when they go down a table of contents is the title. Um, and if you put something there that's not in the paper, then people are going to stop reading your work. Um, or I would anyway. So the second thing is that it has to be attractive. So we all scan tables of contents all the time and we choose which papers we're going to read. And that's generally based on the title, or at least it'll take us to the abstract. Then we might read the abstract. If that looks interesting, then we'll devote the time to read the paper. Um, so it has to be accurate. It has to be attractive. And then just my own personality, I guess, I like to put a little bit of a tweak in it. Um, for example, um, one of the most recent ones is I wrote a paper in 2009 with uh, Ryan Fig about perianal Crohn's disease. And I thought it was, you know, it was a, an idea I had about the disease, which I still um, stand by. But I noticed that nobody had ever read it. So every time I would go to a meeting, nobody ever said anything about it. And yet it's crucial to treating perianal Crohn's disease. So then I looked up to see how many times it had been cited. And this was about two years ago, and it had been cited five times. So then I wrote, um, and Susan kindly published a commentary entitled Missing the Boat, which I thought accurately described what I was gonna say. It um, should attract people to read the commentary and had a bit of a, a, um, a twist to it. Thank you. Um, now, if you're to go back to, or if you think about starting colorectal practice, what pointers would you 
give yourself as a technician, a clinician, and an academic? Um, um, maybe I can address that by saying what point is what I give somebody else because, um, sure, you know, I, I, I think the way that um, I followed through it was, has been pretty standard. So you arrive in colorectal uh, practice as a product of your training. And during that training, you've, you've developed an interest and you have come under the influence of a variety of mentors. Uh, one or two of which you really like and really like you, and you've modeled yourself on those. So you may take aspects of your technical uh, and thought processes and the way you practice uh, from one person or from a, uh, a variety of people who take a little bit, and that ends up as your uh, surgical DNA. And like regular DNA, it's unique to you, uh, but you've inherited it from a variety of people. Um, and then when you start practice um, in your chosen area, it's up to you to be, try and become an expert on that. And for example, when I started and took over the familiar polyposis registry, I had to learn how to speak genetic language. So I went to the books and learned what I'd never learned at medical school about the science of genetics and genomics. Um, and that stood me in good stead because I could speak to the scientists uh, basically in their own language, understand what they were writing about and researching about. Um, and um, I've always thought that a good surgeon is a thoughtful surgeon. It's not like cut along the dotted line. Uh, it's figure out what's wrong with the patient. Why are you doing what you're planning on doing? Are there other ways of doing it? Uh, what is the disease telling you? What is happening with the disease that you're trying to treat? So it, it's all about being thoughtful. Um, so that, that's the basics. Thank you. Um, now, you, you, colorectal cancer in the young is increasing, and you have some thoughts on or some theories as to why. Um, can you just share those with us? I have a theory. Um, <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> James is theory. So whatever theory you, you generate has to account for the fact that 65% of these cancers are in the rectum and another 18% are in the sigmoid colon. Uh, it has to account for the fact that they're not MSI high, they're not uh, mismatch repair deficient. Um, and they're occurring in young people and this phenomenon has, has happened arguably since the 60s. And, start, and, and gotten worse since then. Um, so family history is a big component of that. In our series, 32% of young people had a family history, but that meant that 70% didn't have a family history. So clearly environment has a lot to say about it. So it occurred to me that um, if, well, we, let's think about the normal path of defecation. That's something that colorectal surgeons should be thinking about every day. Uh, stool sits in the sigmoid, and then once a day on the average, it gets pushed into the rectum by a mass movement. You get the urge to go, you go, the rectum's now empty again, and all is well. The young people these days, I think, get that urge, but they're on their iPhone, they're on their iPad, they're texting, they're playing a, a video game. They think, I'm not going to the bathroom now, I'm too busy. Um, or they're at the mall and they don't want to go to the mall bathrooms, or they're in the operating room and they can't go to the bathroom. So for whatever reason, the stool is sitting in the rectum for two hours, three hours, four hours, whereas it's only supposed to be there five minutes. And that is causing some changes when it's happening day in, day out, over the months and over the years, some proneoplastic changes in the cells. Um, and so, Nobody's ever looked at that. Nobody ever even asks how often do you defer defecation and how, how long by uh, on any questionnaires. So this is James's theory. Thank you. Um, now, there's been a huge amount of progress, arguably, um, in colorectal cancer care over the last 40 years. Um, what do you think is around the corner um, in, particularly, what are your views on personalized um, medicine? 
But I think what you're getting at and what, you know, what I think myself is routine tumor sequencing um, to go along with routine constitutional DNA sequencing so that we have a, a complete picture of what's in that patient's DNA and what's in that tumor. And um, that will instantly tell us, um, is there a syndrome? If there's not a syndrome, what has happened? Is it sporadic? Uh, what's the risk of that patient? Uh, how's that tumor likely to behave? Uh, and what targeted therapies can we use to attack it? Uh, we don't know all the aspects of that yet. We're just at the very um, well, uh, early stages of immune therapy. Um, there's a lot that can be done. Um, tumor vaccines are another aspect of this. Um, so that personalizing tumor treatment is going to be the key in the future. Thank you. Um, and probably my last question is, um, uh, you're writing your own book at the moment. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes. Yeah, so it, I'm sad that I'm leaving uh, the department right now. I, I wish I could put a hologram or clone of myself in the corner so that um, I can keep on giving advice where it's sought and um, telling about the things that I do that in, in general are not done by a lot of people. Um, so I thought I would write it down instead of having a hologram or a clone of myself, I will write it down. So it's going to, my provisional title is what I have learned. So what I have learned about dash, 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 and including in that is what I've learned about thinking up a research idea, what I have learned about writing a manuscript, what I've learned about presenting a paper, what I've learned about um, being a member of a department, what I've learned about being a family man and a surgeon at the same time. Uh, and then what I have learned about investigating rectal bleeding, what I've learned about managing hemorrhoids, what I've learned about repairing fistulas, what I've learned about anything. So the table of contents is about eight pages long, single space. So I'm going to have to sort that out. But it's not going to be an encyclopedia. It's not going to be evidence-based medicine. It's going to be things that I have learned that um, in many cases are unique to me and may be of help to other people. So that's the aim. Well, uh, I'm looking forward to, um, to reading it. If I may be so bold is I'm going to try to get it autographed somehow. <laughs> I'll be happy to um, have you as one of the editors, Vlad. <laughs> Uh, I, I can do the pictures. <laughs> All right. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, thank on you very much for your time. On the good point, I so, heard that the tripartite is going to be in uh, in New Zealand next February, so we can all get our autographs and copies then. Oh, it will be done by then, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, um, I think that concludes our session for today. Um, I'd really like to thank uh, Dr. Paul Weiss and the, the faculty from St. Louis. Um, I think it's been fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Church, um, and thank all the audience. Um, uh, our next session will be in about a month's time in, um, in Massachusetts. Um, uh, and we're going to be talking about pelvic floor. Um, so thanks, everyone, and Thank see you next month. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a great night. Be safe. <laughs>